The global race for rare earth minerals is intensifying, driven by surging demand in clean energy, defense and advanced technology. South Africa, with its vast resources of critical minerals, is emerging as a potential key player in this shifting landscape. Well, among them is Tienkamp's Kroll, a monazite mine. As it scales up operation, the mine could be positioning itself as a strategic force in the global rare earth market. And I'm so happy to be joined by CEO Graeme Solon from Sienkamp's Kroll um, today to talk about that. Hi, Graeme. So nice to meet you. Afternoon, Linda, and afternoon to all of the viewers. Can we give us a brief history of Stiankamp's Kroll? You know, where do you come from and where are you now? Mm. Okay, Stiankamp's Kroll was discovered some time ago, but the most important information is it was operated by Anglo-American between 1952 and 1963. Um, they were mining the, the monazite to concentrate it, and then they were selling it to British nuclear fuels in the UK, who were extracting thorium for whatever use they wanted to try and use it for. And after 10 years, they realized that it was not going to work, and they closed the mine down. If you if you go underground now, you'll see tracks, railway tracks, cocoa pans filled with ore and blasted ore still underground and a stockpile on surface that was drilled and blasted by a steel uh, by Angler in those days. Uh, between 1964 and 2009, there was not much activity and there was no thorium market, so rare earths weren't in demand. And then China literally started to take control of the market. They foresaw what we're actually experiencing now as far back as the 1960s. Um, when the price started to climb in 2010 to geopolitic, due to geopolitical uh, differences between China and Japan, Great Western then came in and started the project, listed it on this land, uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange, concluded a whole lot of exploration, concluded mineral resource estimates, and then uh, started to refurbish the mine. And the Chinese and Japanese sorted their geopolitical issue out and uh, Great Western actually filed for bankruptcy towards the end of 2014. The current majority shareholders then bought the project out of liquidation and they made sure that all of the legislative requirements in terms of the South African mining industry and the rare earth, uh, which is got an inherent radioactivity in it through the thorium content. So the certificate of registration through our nuclear regulator was also obtained. And then a water use license was issued in 2019. Um, because of the complexity of the project and the radioactivity involved in the project, it took longer than usual, but we got the water use license. And then from 2023, the decision was made to take the project into production to reduce the risk on the project. And through that process, we brought in a company called Bora Mining Investments and the Enoch Matabula Foundation, who bought the 30% required for for the BE component. And why we are very glad to have them on board is they bring mining expertise, they bring working capital, and they bring equipment to the project which has allowed us to take the project to a point where we can now go into construction phase to start production, hopefully by the middle of next year. Okay. Well, first of all, um, for people who might not be miners and do not know rare earth minerals that well, mm -hmm. you know, w what exactly is underneath the ground at Stienkamp's Kroll? First of all, Stienkamp's Kroll is known globally to be the richest rare earth deposit of rare earths on the planet. Uh, rare earths are made up of 17 different elements, of which 15 are uh, in, present in our ore body, of the, and it's monazite ore. Where it's, where it's very unique is it's a solid reef that dips, so it's a typical gold mining type situation where we've got competent host rock and we have an ore body that dips with between 30 and 60 degrees. It's a variable thicknesses and variable grades in the ore body. Um, the rare earth elements are, are generally 
well known, but the four predominant ones are neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, and terbium. And they are the four highest content uh, ores that we have, uh, materials that we have, rare earths that we have in our ore body. Um, and we, are, because it's such a solid ore body, it makes it very, it's probably one of the lowest grade mining operations on the planet, but ton, and because of the high grade of ore that we've got, we actually have to mine a lot less run of mine feed to plant material to get the same quantity of ore out of, or quantity of metals or rare earths out of the, the ore body. Um, what is very interesting with Stenkamp's Kroll is the thorium levels are very, very high. Now, thorium is the nuclear radioactive portion of the, the monazite ore. Um, initially, it was a waste stream. We'd get rid of it and put it back underground. We've now got a market for thorium, and the biggest um, positive of that is we are looking at, through a joint venture with a Norwegian pharmaceutical company, we are looking at harvesting the radium-228 off of the thorium. The radium is a naturally occurring daughter product of the decay chain of the thorium. And the radium is used for targeted alpha therapy and cancer treatment. Um, obviously, because of the high grade of thorium we've got, or the high content of thorium we've got associated with the high grade of ore, we also have a very high supply quant uh, potential of radium-228. So apart from the use that you've just um, mentioned in medical care, what other uses are there for these minerals that are at Stemkamp's crawl? Okay. I'll, I'm just mentioning, going back to the four minerals that are Mm -hmm. uh, as mentioned, or there are four rare earths. You're looking at wind turbines, magnets for electric vehicles, solar panels, earphones, headphones, uh, speakers, cordless power tools, smartphones, computers, um, missile and, and military guidance systems in defense, and cameras and catalytic converters. That's just to name a few. But those are our primary targets for our elements. Um, it's a process to get the stuff out of the ore body, um, but we've got technology in South Africa and at, uh, uh, we've got the capability of taking the product up to a, through a concentrate. So we concentrate the ore body to get a constant grade feed through the processing plant. And we're looking at a novel technology called MGS there, uh, multi-gravity separator to replace the the, the well-known spiral gravity separation and flotation. And then the concentrate would go into a caustic cracking process where we separate the, con the thorium off of it. And the thorium is then used for the nuclear, potential nuclear feed product or the, the, and the medical side. And then the mixture of con concentrate, uh, carbonate that remains is what contains these elements, which can then be so, and we've got markets in in Europe, uh, France, uh, Germany, Norway, and then in Canada. And we are also looking at the potential of putting up the separation plants here in South Africa, where we actually separate the elements out of that mixture with carbonate. So big plans, and um, are contracts signed already with these European partners that you mentioned? Some are um, uh, term sheets and some of them are contracts already, yes. And so, so to ramp up or to, to get into production phase, what still needs to be done and how far are you? Okay. This project is once again one of those projects where if you normally take a, a mining project of this nature and you have to take it from greenfields into production, could take anything from five to seven years just to get into production status because you'd have to sink a decline into the ore body. Uh, you'd have to open up underground development ends and then start mining your stopes as you as you go ahead. Um, where this project's unique is Anglo-American did over three kilometers of underground development. So the decline shaft was partially equipped by Great Western and we are busy currently re-equipping that shaft. 
refurbishing it. We've started with a cleanup underground where we're removing the tracks and the coca pans that were left by Anglo. We're refurbishing the infrastructure on surface. Um, we've got a lot of nuclear regulator approvals that we've submitted that we've got approvals on and we're busy submitting new approvals for continued process. Um, what has happened is when we started the project just over two years ago, we were looking at just marketing a concentrate, monazite concentrate of 50% plus contained trio. Um, that has very rapidly changed to us tripling our production and producing a mixed earth carbonate. So the, the life of mine of this project has been shrunk slightly, but uh, where the project is also unique, unique is they, when Great Western did their mining plan, they did it for the life of mine that was under the mining right. And once they acquired that quantity to satisfy that mining right plan or the mining work program for that period, they stopped exploring. And we know from from sur other surveys that the ore body is, can be extended to the east and to the west and to depth because it's a magmatic um, inflow of, of ore. So the, the life of mine currently is in the region of 16 years and we can, through expansion, potentially increase it to another 30 years. You mentioned some EU um, countries or companies that um, have come calling. Have any US companies uh, approached STEM Comscra? Um, we, we were actually surprised for a while that the US was not that keen or hadn't been looking at, you know, there was no keenness shown, if you like. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with us knowing what we've got and the ore body we've got and the, the ease of mining and the grades that we've got, we are and were very surprised that we weren't, since the noise started coming, started coming out about China and the US push back pushing back against each other, um, we got more reaction from obviously the Chinese who would love to get their hands on this project and we're keeping that at bay for now. But we are, we then started to get a lot of inquiries from um, Europe, the European Union. Um, and we responded to that because some of the people in the in the Europe have actually used or have been exposed to some of our product in the past. So they actually understand the product. And it made it easier for us just to keep talking to them. And they came with a open negotiable or negotiation attitude. They didn't come across as a big brother that wanted to demand certain things or force the project in a direction which we didn't want to go. So that is starting to change we are now getting interest shown from some united states entities not necessarily off takers but potential uh, either sla investors slash end users ultimately that would like to talk to us do you think you guys could play an important role in the strategic battle for rare earth minerals um, I think that goes without saying. Um, you know, South Africa geopolitically, although there's a lot of political verbiage out there, if you want to call it, to to say and say it nicely, um, South Africa is still pol geopolitically pretty stable, and the the mining regulations and the nuclear regulations that we fall under are very strict and they're very controlled, and it it, it lends itself more to compliance than anything else and you know I joke about it I've actually got a baseball bat on my table called compliance um, an actual baseball bat but it's more that the guys around me get the feeling of you know what if you're non-compliant you will have problems if you stay compliant 90% of your problems go away and from from that perspective we will definitely have a major impact on, on the global industry um, we don't like talking too much about Stencom Scroll. We're just doing what we know is best for ourselves and we're moving forward. Um, is the government and the regulations at the moment a problem for you You're going forward? Would you have liked to see a bit more give there? Um, Linda, it's a, it's a strange question for me to answer because 
um, I see the potential in any project, even though we don't hide behind any legislation and difficulties that are created by legislation. We, because of the mine's complexity, you must understand this mine has got a mining right, which has got a massive um, oversight from the regulators, from the Department of Mineral and Petroleum Resources. And on top of that, we've got the nuclear regulator who also monitors and manages what we do on site. So we've got a double whammy of, of responsibility as far as that is concerned. So we know that if we don't comply with either of those departments, we will be shut down. And we made the decision that we will remain compliant, we will stick within the rules, and we'll do whatever is difficult as, as what it might be. We will still do it and make sure we can carry on doing it. What we've done through that is we've, we've created a atmosphere, if you like, of uh, good governance in the industry and in, in the powers that be. Um, we sometimes get pushback from counterparts who want to know why we are doing it and they're not doing it. And then I just say to them, well, don't make your problem my problem. Because we have got our, we, we've set our target and we've set our route and we're staying with it. You said it's, the, I mean, the deposits there are very rich. So what kind of deposits are we talking about? Because you said you could probably have an, an extension of about 30 years of the mine eventually. It's, it's actually... The one portion is the exact same ore body that we've got that's fully identified, and it was drilled like a pin cushion. Uh, that's what triggered my interest three years ago when I did the due diligence on the project was the amount of information, the amount of resource work that was done by global, well-known global companies. Um, for instance, the ore body's been intersected at 25-meter grid pattern, square grid, which is unheard of. Um, and then when they stopped drilling, the, there were aerial mag surveys done previously, and they have shown that there is an ore body to the east and the west and to the south. So it's exactly the same ore body that we will, in the 16-year period that we are doing run of mine standard production at steady state, we will start doing exploration at depth to to in a much deeper depth. At the moment, our maximum depth is about 160 meters below surface. And we're expecting to more than double the ore, there is the reported ore uh, content within the next two or three years. When it gets to investment and that type of thing, um, we are open to discussion. We are pretty close to being fully funded on the project, depending which way we want to take it. Uh, where we would look at further investment is if people want us to specify or, or um, isolate a certain product stream off of our, our production, uh, you know, if we have to double our production even more or something like that, we can easily do that because the equipment that we need is so small that the smallest machinery or, uh, for instance, the crushing plant, crushing the, and the mill in the crushing plant is four times bigger than what I will be using it for because I can't get anything small enough because of the high grade of the ore. So once we get into a level where people want to come and talk to us about a, a set supply to them and we isolate a, a stream in the processing plant, we might need some capital investment on that. Um, and for us to take the project further, we would be open to some form of debt finance or a equity partner that would come in on a pref share type basis, or even we've got some equity available if they're interested to come in. But the value of this project is skyrocketing. So if anybody is really interested, they need to come and talk to us quickly. You're saying jump in early. Yeah. Graham Sutton, thanks so much. Thanks for speaking to me. Mm, it's a pleasure.